vote. Okay. All right. There you go. Okay. I was able to do that. So that Okay, works. good. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Okie doke. So let's move on. So welcome to our, um, <coughs> excuse me, our Backyard Wildlife Program. And lucky night tonight. I don't have to give the the um, Backyard Wildlife Spiel because the whole program is about our Communal Wildlife Habitat Project. So we've been doing the project for um, since 2002, and we now have 1,003 certified wildlife habitats on Camino. And, um, and what we're doing it is one yard at a time. So tonight I'll tell you some um, tricks of the trade for creating a wildlife habitat and a little bit of a wildlife sanctuary for you. So the idea is that we've got all these critters that um, are sharing our island with us. And it's a, um, a wonderful spot. And, and it's even more wonderful if we keep some of that native habitat. So on Kameno, it's a matter of we have a lot and, and we don't have to do a lot to create a wildlife habitat if we just kind of leave some of the things that are still there. So that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight, how native plants um, can help. And if you, you do have mainly yard and have had the native plants have been pulled out throughout the years, then there's ways to restore that. So the whole idea with our project is that we're kind of restoring corridors so that the, the critters can have some space and it's not so um, dismal. So looking at the habitat loss between 1984 and 2020, um, it's, it's kind of uh, sad to look at. And I started the project um, with a lot of people joining in with me because I was uh, sick of seeing the logging trucks roll off the island and not having anything that was um, real doable because basically if there's right uh, regulations that allow logging, then logging happens. However, what we do in our backyards does make a difference and that we're able to restore corridors. So um, in some of these areas that are looking a little uh, gray rather than green, uh, you know, adding some plants in there maybe will show up in a picture in later years if we're thinking about how we can improve our yards and our properties so that we're living um, with the nature on the island that it always used to be before a lot of people came. So this uh, grass and uh, some shrubs in a tree is a pretty sterile environment. It's sterile to look at and it's also not doing much for the wildlife. So there are ways to change all that. And everything we do, we need to think about because we live on an island, things are going right into Puget Sound um, sooner rather than later. Because since our stormwater system is directly into Puget Sound. So we, if we can change like what goes into the water and keep some of that um, things that are draining up in our yards, like with rain gardens and various things, then we're doing the, the fish and the critters in the, um, the Puget Sound or the Salish Sea um, well as well. So the ways to do it, I'll get into, but if you look at the before and after picture, this is my yard. And actually the before picture is not, is like in between. So we started the project in 2002 and in 2002, the left side that has the big trees um, was grass, like the right-hand side. And then the right-hand side is no longer grass with a few trees. It's grass with a layering system. And I'll talk about layering later on. But I have ground cover, shrubs, and trees. And I um, have a lot of wildlife. And I don't even see them sometimes. And I can tell you on those really hot days, when I go up the stairs. I live down the pathway down the stairs near the beach, but up above is where our driveway is and, and we've got some space. When I go up the stairs, I am seeing um, blush green and it's really cool. And I peek through the bushes or peek through the trees and my neighbors have grass and it's brown and it's hot and um, not very inviting. But when I go up, it's, it's really quite lovely to be there. And I'm hearing the birds. I'm seeing the bunnies go underneath the, uh, the bushes. And I have an eagle's nest, so the bunnies are safe because the bushes are covering them up. So I didn't do this 
in uh, right away. It took like a lot of years and, and the plants have gotten bigger and bigger as well. So that's something to think about, but I, I did it in pieces. So like up front where there's a, there's a, a bird bath, uh, that was kind of a planting area that was here right away. And, um, and I didn't do much to that, but then the, then I added planting areas and then I just took over the whole yard. And so, and then you can see, like I've got the arbor with a paddle and I you add some yard art and then my messiness is um, artsy and good for the wildlife. So the idea is to get rid of the grass, um, not all the grass, you don't have, we don't have any grass left, but if you get rid of the grass, um, then you have a lush garden and it's helping the critters and it's also helping our res our watershed and it's also helping um, our cells because it's, it's a nice place to be. So in the the picture here, the what's it, the things that are in common is that inside the picture, it's actually a, a wildlife habitat just in that little area because it's a matter of having food, water, shelter, and places to raise young. So we can see the water, uh, bath in the the bird bath in the the, the on the ground and um, there's some feeders there's plants and so the plants are providing both food shelter and places to raise young and they even provide water like they'll have um, you know a dew will settle there or rain will the leaves will catch the um, some water so little creatures can can enjoy that just from the your plants. So the plants we plant make a difference and provide a lot. Water sometimes is more difficult, but I'll go into that more. So here's the four basic needs for wildlife. And um, and most of them are just we can have just with our with the plants that we plant. The water, sometimes you have to be more creative and that can be as simple as the bottom of a bird of a of a flower pot, a little basin that catches the water so it doesn't drip places. And if you add rocks, and so it's not as steep as side, and you add some sand or something so it's not slippery, then you have a bird bath. And you can say you're cert have to be a certified wildlife habitat. So here are the basic steps. Notice in this diagram the layering. So you've got your trees, your shrubs, uh, and some ground cover and some smaller shrubs. So the first thing you want to do is kind of look at what you have in your space. And part of that is like, how is it being used? And when the National Wildlife Federation is how we're um, having the yard certified on Kameno and nationally as well. And they certify homes, workplaces, farms, um, schools. On Kameno, we have the Elger Bay School certified when the Utsalati school hasn't really wanted to play with us, so um, they're not certified yet, but they could be getting willing people. It can also be apartment and um, rooftop gardens as well as decks. And all most of our parks on the island are certified. We have a um, St. Aidan's is the one church that's certified on the island. So there's lots of different habitat types that you can have. And that kind of gets it how the place is being used. So the amount of space you have and how often people are going there factors into what you, you, could, you do with your yard. Then you also are looking at what kind of um, lands, uh, topography, you know, for my house, we, um, we live on the water. I have a steep bank that I climb down the stairs and then I have a slope and, um, and so it, it, there's a lot of different things going on in the yard. And so you kind of look that over. And so I went out and I figured out, I want to make sure my slope is good. So that means I planted some um, wild rose, some madrona trees, and, um, and some ground cover so that it will, um, the, the slope will stay put. And I have a west sun and a lot of shade. Um, so, so you're thinking about what's there, what used to be there, and um, where you're going. Now, Russell Link, he is a biologist, a wildlife, fish and wildlife biologist um, for the state, and he has a book, Landscaping for Wildlife, and 
um, living with wildlife. And in that book, he talks about areas. And so with, within a yard, there's like an area one, area two, and area three. And the area one is close to the house. It's where we're living and, and at a lot. So that is where there's high traffic. So if you wanna have bird feeders and you wanna have um, things that you put out to supplement, basically that's the spot to put it because you're watching it. The birds don't need to have bird feeders if you're planting the plants that they like. So that in the high traffic area, that's kind of the, the place where you want to see things. You also want to make sure that um, for the firewise aspect that you're not planting things too close to the house. So, but area one is where there's, there's more traffic. Area two is more like a, a mid zone. And this is, you get some trap, some usage, but not as much as close to the house. And then area three is the part of the yard that doesn't really um, get a lot of, of access. And this can be, you know, if you have big acreage, like Four Springs Lake Preserve is one of our demonstration gardens. And so that's on a huge scale. We've got the house is area one, the trails would be area two, and all the stuff in the middle where people don't go is the area three a lot that's kind of in a development is, is a whole different ball game. However, if, if those backyards of people are, are all considered area threes, then those backyards that meet up together can actually kind of create a corridor again for the wildlife because if the backyards of people, they meet up, they, they link together, then we're actually helping to, to prevent, to restore corridors. And that's part of the mission of our wildlife habitat project is to use people's yards together so that the corridors are restored and so there's links between the parks, the wonderful parks we have on the island. So when you're doing your site inventory, it's good to think, okay, you know, I want to have a brush pile. So you wouldn't want that in area one. You don't want it too close to the house because it, it gets some critters in there and it also could be a fire thing close to the house maybe. Um, but if you put it in the back of the property, and it's kind of doing its decomposing type of thing. It's, it's wonderful um, habitat and shelter for the wildlife. And it's, it's not so unsightly because it is out of the way and in the area three where you don't need to go. So rather than burning things up or taking them to the, um, to the transfer station, this is a way to, to create some habitat use the vegetation that's, that's, that you, or the, the scraps of vegetation um, for a, a benefit. Like I learned once we had a speaker, Sophia Pastor, and she let us know that, you know, when a tree drops its leaves, that that is enough nutrients for the tree. So in our yard, we just let the tree, the leaves fall, except for in the driveway. And, you know, by the springtime, our ground cover comes out underneath the, the big leaf maple leaves and we didn't do any raking. So the whole idea is to, oh, I'm, I'm kind of one off on a tangent there, but um, how you're using the, the, um, the areas. And so it's area three where the big leaf maple leaves are falling down. Um, they're out in my area three, so it doesn't really matter that they're just there providing nutrients for the big leaf maple and the other trees there. Okay, so then um, once you kind of have the ideas, then you can figure out how you want to put the, the elements, the food, water, shelter, and places to raise young in. So starting out with the native plants, and there, there's lots of different ways for, um, that they're providing it. They have the berries, they have the um, the nectar on the flowers, they have the, um, you know, the, there might be some insects on it. So they, they even, um, so, so that's why they're, so if you, um, anyway, I'm on a tangent. So they provide a lot of different, in different ways, different times of the season. Okay. So here's all the stuff I was trying to say. And I should, if I would have just pressed I would have been able to tell you all this. So we've got the foliage, the nuts, the fruits, the seeds, the sap, the nectar, the pollen, the roots, and um, all the different um, critters are, are taking what they want out of it and, and getting it. And, you know, like in the, the, the birds, sometimes they, they feed their, um, their young ones a lot of insects 
um, and they might be seed eaters most of the year, but the insects are, are some of the things that they're giving. So you want to, to be okay with um, insects around your plants and think of them as uh, feed for the birds rather than nuisances. And so um, the supplemental feeders are, are good for us to look at. They're not necessarily necessary if you're providing the, thing, the food sources that they need in the yard. If you do want to um, put the suet holders up or the bird feeders and the hummingbird feeders, you need to remember to clean them. So cleaning is um, mandatory if you're going to do the supplemental feeding because they, they get dirty like last year or um, this past winter, we couldn't, we were told to take our feeders down because of the salmonella and the pine siskins dying from that. So it's real important. Hummingbird feeders, uh, you know, with the hot sun in the summer, you need to do a lot of cleaning with that. So the, the best deal is to provide plants for them so that they don't, you don't have to do much feeding. Um, but in the winter there, when it, when it snows and things like that, it is nice to have that supplemental um, feeder available. But it's remembering, okay, if I'm going to put that feeder up, I need to make sure that I'm cleaning it. So here are some um, native plants that are in the Pacific Northwest that are useful. And you can see that we've got the berries there that um, various birds like. And um, so that's one. And sal salmon, salmon berry, salmon, salmon berry there. And this is always nice. You can kind of know that spring is coming because you see the salmon berry. If you plant the salmon berry, you know it, it's it's a bigger bush type of plant, so you, you need to have some space for that. But um, you can see that a lot of uh, the the um, birds like it, and you know, the, like the thrushes and towhees and wrens, they like to be kind of. Um, near the ground, when I show you the layering, they're, they're more of a lower species. So they're good to poke around in that as well as it provides cover for them too. And thimbleberry as well. And the plant is provides, it's providing both with the, on um, the blossoms in the springtime and the berries later on. And so plants have their, their, um, their purposes throughout the season as well. It's also good to think when you're planting about the time of year things bloom. So it's, that's important for the bees and the butterflies in that you have a, a, a garden that is blooming throughout the year, not just in the spring. You're thinking spring, summer, and fall because the bees and the butterflies, there's various ones out at different times and providing that is good. Okay, Oregon grape. This is my favorite. This is just a wonderful plant. It's so easy to grow. It doesn't get um, over, it's not a, a one that gets out too far. It kind of stays in its area. So you don't have to worry about spreading too much. It likes it, um, the drought, I, it's good on the slopes. And so, and it provides, it has the flowers in the springtime and the berries in the, um, Later on, oh, I, I see that we've had got some berries on on one of ours is that, or that I noticed. So anyway, it, it's a, a great one, and it's this one is readily available at the nurseries. This is one of nurseries ha, do have some native plants. Some have native plant sections, and some oh mix it in. And this is one that you can get a a low a oh. Roxy, is it low Oregon grape? The tall Oregon grape, there's a shorter one and a higher one. And, um, and they um, are quite nice to have around. And dogwood, so note that this one is good in the fall and that, that is one, sometimes people forget about the fall and, and the migratory birds coming through and whatnot. So this is, this is a good one for that. Okay. And lots of birds seem to like that one. And then the asters are good for insects. And that is um, important as well, because insects 
all the birds are eating the insects and they feed their young the insects and the insects are pollinators. So thinking of them as part of the ecosystem and part of our world rather than nuisances um, helps get the flowers blooming. And attracting butterflies, people like to do that. And when you're thinking about attracting butterflies, note that there's a, there's a whole process to a butterfly becoming that beautiful beauty, flying beauty. And um, so you you're planning for the different stages. So there's the egg there, the larva, the pupa, and then the butterfly. So it's remembering you're not just planning for the butterfly, you want the various stages to get to the butterfly. Okay, so that is the, the native plants and uh, the food aspect. Now for the water aspect, and this is the most difficult for people to just have, and it's, it's, um, but it's not difficult when you think about the various things that um, are available. Like the frog in this, uh, the frog was, was on this leaf during our garden tour uh, one year when we were on the north end, and there was a great big pool of water in this great big leaf, and there that little, that little frog was able to find some water. If you look at a log, those, um, the um, nurse logs in our yards, if you don't chop them up and take them away and, and let them decay, there's, there's water in that wood that's helping some of the insects. So there's, there's ways to, that are available for water that we're, if we just let nature do its thing, it, it's providing some water. Then there's providing it and they're very at, as simple as a bird bath. Note that simple bird baths are going to be better for the birds than some of the fancy ones. Some of the fancy ones have, they're, they're pretty, but they're slippery and they're steep. So they're, they're kind of too, they're too difficult for the birds because if they slip on it or they're, they're too steep to, to function, then, you, um, then the birds aren't going to use it or they might have some problems with it. So, and you can get pretty fancy if you like as well. So, and here are some other um, ways to think about the uh, water sources. So the simplest is just to put that pan that's the, from the bottom of a plant or plant, a plant pot. And the other thing is the natural things that are available. Um, and puddling areas, like the, the butterflies like the puddling areas. And sometimes you have some seasonal um, parts of the, the yard. I know the senior center or the Camino Center now is a one of our demonstration gardens. It has a trail that still has some signage on it. And that has that the center part of the trail just off the parking lot and the, the trail that goes near the road is wet in the winter. There's the, there's like a pond there and then in the summer it dries out. So sometimes you have a seasonal um, what seasonal water source. Okay. And um, here is a bird bath my bird bath before uh, more things have grown. But you note there's not much down around the bottom. There's a little stuff on the top. Since then, I, I have added some some bushes, some trees on the side, so they have places to to um to travel before they go to the bird bath. So you want a lot of of branches and various things so that birds will flit and float and, and get to the bird bath in a safe way. Underneath, you want to think about not having a lot. So you, I don't have a lot of foliage underneath because that is a spot like cats could lurk there. So predators can lurk in the bushes. So when you're you're putting out something that is supplemental and, and water is, is pretty important, especially right now in this, this summer drought, that you have to think about, okay, I, I want them safe from above because there are hawks and various things that think of my bird bath as a place and my bird feeders as place to get their little niblets. And um, so I've got branches up above that and then underneath I'm keeping it clear so I don't have any predators that can hide. So, so there are the things to think about when you're putting things out for the critters. And there's lots of different ways. The, the running water is a, a big hit. And 
Oh, and you can have things on the ground too. I, um, because that's helpful. I know. I figure my bunnies are going for my little my ground water sources. Moving water there. And then in the winter, so they actually have uh, bird baths that heat, and so you can do that, or you can just be very diligent and and go and and get some fresh water when there's there's ice in the bird bath. It doesn't last very the um, our our cold weather doesn't last too long, so it, it's not a um, hard thing to do during those few days that we have frozen bird baths. Okay. And then thinking about puddling areas as well. And this, I already mentioned that. So you can see in this bird bath, there's a lot of um, places for cats to lurk and various um, other predators that might like birds. And it doesn't have any overhead cover. So then you're kind of providing a nice um, without that. So those are things to think about. Then moving on to shelter. So you can see lots of different ways that um, shelter is available, both in the structures that we can um, put up, the bird houses and the um, nesting boxes. And so when you do that, you have to remember that they need to be cleaned as well. And so whenever you put something up that you're putting out for the wildlife, you need to think, I'm, I'm doing the supplemental, so I also need to clean it. And, and if you think about the, the snag, so if you have a tree that is needing to come down, you might not need to take the whole tree down. You could take a part of it. So the part that might not fall, if you're worried about falling on your house, you could take down the part that would fall on your house and leave the rest because the the tree snags are just incredible sources for wildlife for the woodpeckers for the cavity nesters for insects that are feeding the birds and um and i know at the senior center earlier in our project we there were some trees that they were worried that were going to fall in the parking lot so lolly one of our habitat steward volunteers made sure that when those trees were cut, that they would be snags and that they had a coronet cut. So they weren't just cut flush, um, straight saw, it was cut like a, a king's crown. And so that was more like if it had would have fallen into the forest. And so it was the jagged edges. And that helps it rot a little bit faster and provide rather than um, and, the, and that rotting and decaying is providing nutrients for some critters and it's also adding a water source for some critters and so that and it's more like a natural um, snag or nurse log if it actually falls the other thing is if something falls in your yard and it's in your area three then if you leave it there then it, it's providing for um wildlife and it and it will just naturally decay and return to to the soil a brush pile is another place for um, critters to, to take um, shelter and rock piles as well. So, and here's all the different ones that aren't worked on the pictures. So, the, um, the bramble patches are wonderful. So if you're thinking you have to get rid of all your blackberries, then think about what are you going to replace the, and blackberries are invasive. Um, how can you replace them? So, you know, you could say, okay, I'm taking out the blackberries, I'm going to put in wild rose. So then the bramble patch will still be there um, and it will still provide food in some way during the, um, the various parts of the season. And so if you take something out that you find invasive, then put something back in that wouldn't be invasive and then there will still be wildlife habitat. And ground cover, much better than grass. Plus, you don't have to water it after it gets established. It just grows. Log piles are wonderful. I don't know if we have any caves. Roosting box, remember, you do need to clean that if you choose to do put that up. And um, the dense shrubs and thickets and bramble patches 
Um, that's something to think about. If you think that you want to put up a, a fence, another way to do it is to have a hedgerow. So if you get various plants that, um, that aren't going to spread out, and when I show you our, our native plant sheet, we have it in, like, do you have a large area that's wide or do you have a narrow area? And some of the narrow areas might be perfect for like a hedgerow, like Oregon grape could be, tall Oregon grape could be in there, and you put in different things, and then you have something that is providing for wildlife, it looks nice, and it's not a barrier. Brush piles and rock are good for the um, area three. The rock wall, uh, we have one, and um, for part of our slope, and I can see things crawling around in there, or once in a while I see a uh, uh, gecko, what do we call them? Salamanders, and um, snake uh, getting warm. So I figure I have a healthy garden when I see them. And for meadows and prairies, if you put some, some grass, the tall grass or various things on your drain fields rather than just straight grass, that if it doesn't have a, a large root, if it's a shallow root, you can do something with your drain field besides just grass. Okay, if you want a rain garden, there's kind of some specifics that you need according to your land. That gets a little more technical. Okay, so here gets into the layering ideas. So the big leaf maple, the Oregon grape, and the strawberry. And you could even throw something like a wild rose in between the um, Oregon grape and the big leaf maple or a, a smaller tree. So you're thinking about layering, and that way you have a, a nice yard, and it's actually doing something for the critters. I know we put in strawberries in our yard when we first started our ground cover. We had some strawberries, some salal, and some kinnikinnik. Kinnikinnik kind of grows slowly. Strawberries, they take off, so you can you can supplement, you can, like later on, the, the kinnikinnik has grown into where the strawberries were. The salal, that is, um, is a slow grower and it can get kind of big. So you have to think about, oh, it, I think it's listed as a ground cover in some places, but it, it will become a bush too. So uh, a wonderful bush and um, it provides, it has the berries and um, flowers. And so it's good stuff. But if you have, I'm, I'm if you have, think about the layering system, then in your yard, one, it's really nice and lush and you don't have just dry grass. And two, it, it's helping the wildlife um, because it's providing for a lot of different wildlife. Um, and this was um, on the garden tour over when we had the, on the north end over by Juniper Beach. So on the other side of the road, you can kind of see a, a, someone's house on the right hand side. And that is, um, you know, that's the beach community that has just house after house after house. And most of them, it's just grass in the house and pretty bleak for wildlife. She was on the other side of the road and um, in a little spot and she, and it was kind of a narrow spot and she created all this uh, lush, lush vegetation and, and has her layers and then she, um, used kind of some yard art to in order to put up her feeders and her bird bath. And it was just delightful. It was just a real pleasant place to be on a hot June day when we did the garden tour that year. So if on the website, and I think Roxy is going to put the, uh, the links to this as well or the PDFs so that you can get this, but it, it the, you can get this on the website. But our native plant list is structured in the way of layering. So on the left-hand side, that, that's hard to read, you can see what kind of birds like the various things. So like towhees and wrens and thrushes like the ground, um, kinglets are kind of up near the top. Um, and, and so you're thinking about providing with the layering because the various birds in this case like the different spots. So if you look at our, you take that idea with the, the overstory, then the, the, the tall trees, the understory with medium sized trees and then the shrubs and then the ground cover, that is how we laid out our, 
native plant list. So when you look at that, when it says on their understory, you're going, oh, okay, that's you know just under the, the tall trees. And those are the plants that will work. And we've got it laid out so that if you have a narrow area or a wide area, it's like one side of the page is the one side is wide and the other side is narrow. And then it gets into the, the soil conditions. Is it moist? Is it dry? Is it sunny? Is it shady? And so we've got suggested plants according to the types of things going on in your yard. So these two resources are, are useful. So we've got them on the website. We also have, um, I think the, the links will be put into the chat. The other thing is, if you want to get an idea of the native plants, if you go to the Snohomish Conservation District website and look at their, their catalog for their plant sale, their catalog is like a field guide. So you can, you can see what the plants are here and then you can go and look at their plant catalog. And so, you know, you're gonna look at last year's plant catalog because they probably don't have this year's up yet, but you're going to be able to see, well, there, there's a wild rose and I, I um, so I wanna put that out. So what does that look like? Salel, what does that look like? Um, and it will, uh, Oregon grape, I talked about that. And, and um, so you can get a good look at it by using the Snohomish Conservation District website their um their catalog you can also go to the native plant society washington has a great native plant society and they'll have information and the national wildlife federation has a native plant guide on it as well that that's a great resource so any of those sites will help you see the plants that are listed on our native plants sheet but we purposely structured the native plant sheet with the idea of layering because that's where because a tall tree and grass is sterile. It doesn't do anything for the, for well, the, it'll do a little, the tree will do something, the grass won't do much at all. So the idea is to think about the layering system. Places to raise young. So here we go. Now, um, so there's all sorts of things that um, are available. I know my husband was out in the yard Oh, one year and he was working with the sword fern which is another great plant to have that's a native plant and he was doing something with the sword fern he thought he needed to tidy it up that's until the towhee started to get after him and because there was a towhee nest in the sword fern so so the lot of, so a lot of the things that um that are out there can be spots for nesting for the wildlife so the mature trees, we've got a we've got an eagle's nest up high and we've got towies down low in the, the sword fern. So there's lots of different places for them to to nest. It's interesting with the um, cavity nesters. I know I went to to a um, oh it was a thing about climate change and and then the nesting birds the ones that are flying in, that are flying in based on the the way the sun is, that's how they base their migration according to, you know, okay, it's that time of year, I need to get going. And they're basing it on, on that aspect versus ones that are doing more localized, re, localized um, migration, like they might be coming down from up higher in the mountain or in the foothills and they come down lower. And the cavity nesters that are flying from the long distances are having problems because the cavities are gone because the, the low, the, the migratory birds that are localized are getting them. So if you keep your snags up and, um, and think about the various things that are going to provide some cavity nesting and help those migratory birds, that's um, a nice thing to, to consider. So, um, and remembering the host plants for caterpillars. So you may not like the caterpillars, but they make beautiful butterflies. And so it's thinking about various um, things that are needed for, for raising the young. Let me see. Okay, that takes care of that. Then you can also put up the, the birdhouses and the nesting boxes which are becoming more important with the cavities being gone when 
in the trees and various things um, as we lose habitat. So snags and woodpecker trees, they are absolutely wonderful. And so you should, I know that people sell them. They, they do some logging and then they try to, then they, they sell them and people buy them for yard art, but they, they're doing marvelous things and they're, they're providing the nesting, they're providing some um, food, so, and some shelter. And those little crevices in the rock piles and the brush piles are doing as well. Remember brush piles, you know, you may not like the look of them, but they are an area three thing. We also have a, a handout about how to make a brush pile if you, if you want to get into it. Then um, the um, marsh and forest, if you've got a lot of acreage, there's things, this is from our, the, this is the heron nest on the right there, um, the heron colony on the island. So going beyond the basics, so the way when people certify their yards, they, they need to show, or we need to show how to provide food, water, shelter, and place to raise young. And it's also having responsible gardening. And so here are some ways to do that. And we, we mentioned the reducing the lawn and the natives. Water conservation is, is important because we live on an island and our water is, you know, down under us. And so what we do with, with up above on the, the land um, makes a difference because everything we collect in our ground is where, where we get our water. Now, you, you don't have to be a purist when you um, certify, so you don't have to do all of these things. You just need to be able to do a, a few of them. But I know with um, certifying, I know for myself, I've become more responsible because I think about what I'm doing in my yard. So, you know, you may not be at the stage that you want to eliminate pesticide use or reduce the use and the fertilizer use. But as you think about it and what, what's going on, then you may, may get to that stage. So you don't need to be a purist um, to be a wildlife habitat, but you need to be willing to grow perhaps to, to think about what you're doing. Okay. And so, um, yeah, you can see the rest. So the idea is that um, by what we're doing, remember, it's that we're, we're helping restore the habitat loss. So the idea is if we, if we all have these area threes in our, the backs of our yards, then um, they can connect and then they do make a difference. So it's not just my single backyard. It's uh, on my area, it's like we've got a whole line of people that have a lot of um, wildlife habitat on the backside that's in our area threes. It's also thinking about um, climate change and the National Wildlife Federation has, actually has a garden, gardener's guide to global warming. And it's interesting. So like our lawn mowers and leaf blowers and all that uh, mechanical stuff is, is polluting. The lawn mower, they, it doesn't have any uh, like cars have to have so much that they emit, lawnmowers don't have that restriction. So they're actually putting a lot of um, stuff into the atmosphere that doesn't need to go there. And if you have a native habitat, then you, you're reducing what you're having to do to cut the lawn or manage things. So here are some things to think about with climate in our backyards. So the gasoline powered yard tools is a big deal because like I just said, they don't, they don't have any restrictions on that, what's emitted. So they're re actually really big polluters. And if you're thinking about reducing um, your invasive species, note that it's good to put in something in its place. So like um, ivy is another one that, that, that is a big, um, invader and it also is still being sold in the nurseries so you know if you're going to take the ivy out then what are you going to replace it with and you can't to, to just take all the ivy out at once is going to be difficult to, to get things to grow right away so you can think of things in patches you know i'm going to do this much 
and, and get something started. And then I can remove some more as whatever gets bigger and I add some more. Reducing water consumption is a important, on, especially for our island living. The rain garden, if you go to the Snohomish Conservation District, they can, they'll have some information on rain gardens that would be helpful. And we had a program on green roofs, so that, that's another option. Or you can do it just on a shed rather than the house. Planting trees, it can help with uh, shade in the summer and letting the sun in in the winter if you do deciduous trees. So there you go. Different ways to think about how you can help with global warming or climate change. To certify your yard, and you, you, can, you can do all this and, and have a, a nice backyard, but you also can kind of join in with a lot of us that have certified our yards because then you're like you're part of something and, and it feels good. And you also think about what you're doing. You're more conscientious. Um, I know I am. It's like, okay, I can't, I, I, if I start to walk by and I see that my bird bath needs some water, um, then I stop and I fill it up and then I go on my way because in the summer it goes empty pretty quickly. Or if I'm going to get some new plants, I can think, oh, I can just get a plant that's pretty, but it's kind of sterile as far as doing anything for the critters. However, if I go to my little plant list there, I can think about, okay, this one is going to be good uh, because it's going to flower in the summer and most of my things are flowering in the winter in the in the spring so i need some summer flowers and some fall flowers so you if you think about it makes you more conscientious about what you're doing in the yard so then there's a lot of people doing it so you're part of something and the national wildlife federation has been certifying yards since 1973 so they have uh, 200, they must be approaching 300,000 by now. And it's a simple application. This application is the one that we use on Kameno. It's the only thing that's different is I've put the, the Friends of Kameno Island Parks address on it because that is who sponsors our Kameno Wildlife Habitat Project. However, there, um, there are generic ones that have you mail it to Virginia if you're not from from Kameno, or if you are from Kameno, if you aren't from Kameno and you send it in to our friends of Kameno Island Parks, I, I send them in. I, I, we collect them ourselves because I count, so I know that we are getting on to 1,100 backyard wildlife habitats on the island, and I can kind of make sure that everything goes smoothly with the National Wildlife Federation. So, oh, and it, it's a simple, simple application. So on the on the first page. You're just saying how you're providing food and, and water, and it's a simple checklist. It's like, you okay, you're showing three different ways that you provide food. One way that you find have water, and then two for um, places to raise young and shelter. And if you notice in, when you get the application that the food, water, and shelter, the, the same things are being listed. So the... the um, berries can be providing some some water as well as some food so it, it's it's if you have a plant in there it's doing a number of different things then you get to list what you have and then the other side is is showing sustainable ways that you are helping so it, it's just a checklist and there is no check on what you're doing it's a checklist um, that you can Think about what you're doing now, noting that it's a process. This is not like the perfect wildlife habitat. It is, it's an ever-changing, better wildlife habitat as you get more into to, um, growing for both the, the fun of having a, a sanctuary there that's really nice to be in, as well as something that's helping the wildlife. You'll get a certificate. And if you want, you can put up a sign. So the Kameno Island, on Wildlife Habitat Project, we created our own sign, and that's $15 if you're certified, and then the National Wildlife Federation has theirs. And this is the um, oh, the fourth version, I think, of their signs. We, we started out when there was a little girl with her mom looking at a butterfly, and that was their original 1973 sign, but uh, they're all wildlife habitats and showing that they're providing food, water, shelter, places to raise young. They're nice to have up because wildlife gardens are a little bit messier 
and and some neighbors may not like the messy the messiness, especially in, if you're in a more um, urban area. And if you put up a sign, it gives that little bit of messiness purpose. And it also lets people know that they're certified. And then they call me and say, oh, I can certify my yard. I'm doing what my neighbor is doing. And I can tell them all about the Wildlife Habitat Project. The other thing is yard art is nice to have in the yard because you're, you're with a wildlife habitat um, garden, you're thinking about you know, I'm not clipping the things when they go to seed. Like right now, the ocean spray, which I love ocean spray in June um, when it's out and it's just has all those little bitty flowers that work together and they look like, oh, like grapes hanging from the vine and they're in, in teeny format. They're just gorgeous. And then they dry out and, and some people don't like them dried up. But chickadees do. I, I watch my chickadees go wild going all around the, the dried ocean spray. So the ocean spray has that beauty and it's providing some nectar, I suppose. And then it, it all those seeds that are, are still stuck on the branch because I'm letting it be messy um, is providing. So you don't have to do the pruning and, and cutting and all that. It's, it's just letting things go a little bit um, longer and so that the wildlife can benefit from it. But signs and yard art gives it all purpose. So community wildlife habitat is what Kameno is. And I'm adding this in because it, it's, it's a, a bigger deal than just certifying our yard and doing what, what we want in our yard. It's like if we work together, then, then we're actually benefiting the wildlife and that that map that I had at the beginning that showed 1984 and, and 2020 uh, can be filled in a little bit with what we do in our yards and so even though there's a development there those backyards don't have to be just grass or or you know some people take out their grass and just kind of put something there that they don't have to do much to but if you if you do a wildlife habitat garden you have the plants there and you don't have to do much to it because once they're established, you don't have to do much watering at all and they, they, they just do their growing. Okay, so for a wildlife habitat, people are providing the same food, water, shelter, places to raise young, but it goes beyond the individual to all throughout. So on Kameno, we certified the, uh, the Elger Bay School. And so this is a work party where the we helped plant some roses out there and then the, the kids got involved with uh with their it's an outdoor ed classroom the elder bay trail is one of our demonstration gardens and nature trails so they have actually they do they take science classes out there they do running out there so they have this this wildlife habitat that is available for them to do some some learning because it's right next to the school. And so this just this is the Seattle office and you can you can take that narrow strip like they had on the boulevard and created some wildlife habitat just in that little bit. So and you can do that on a deck, you can do that on a roof uh, on a rooftop. So there's different um, ways to go about having a habitat. You can have just a little bit of space or you can have a lot of acreage and it helps out. So these are all the community wildlife habitats in the Puget Sound area. And we're kind of a, we're almost like you could say we're a community, uh, regional community wildlife habitat because so many ha uh, places are doing it now. Tequila was the first, they certified in 2002. I saw this little notice that said they were certified and then we started in 2000, later on in 2002, certified in 2005. So we've been certified for quite a while and we have been active since 2002. So I know some communities, they get a little tired after they certify and we certified with 500 habitats and we still want to promote the cause of, of providing wildlife habitat in our gardens that link up and and are really doing something for the wildlife. So we continue on with our project. 
Seattle is now a certified community as well as Pierce County. You could say that Kameno, that Island County is a community wildlife habitat because Kameno and Whidbey are both certified, but they didn't want to combine us for certification um, because we were too different according to them. Anyway, we're still going strong. I don't think they're going as strong one would be. And here are our dots on the map. So you can see it's all throughout the island. And it is, you know, you can see that it can be linking up some corridors. It's close to the state parks. It's close to English Boom. It's close to Camano Ridge Preserve. And so that's the idea that we can kind of connect all the, the natural spaces. And this is just some projects. We, we did some, some planting down at Four Springs, which is one of our demonstration gardens down by the lake. We are out, so if you, if you ever need some wildlife habitat information when we table again, uh, we have booths out. And we used to do uh, a, a program, um, put up signs at orchards, but now that kind of um, went, went away. But they still have native plants that you can get there in various places. And that's when we certified as a wildlife habitat. So for more information, you can go to the National Wildlife Federation. You can actually certify online with them, or you can uh, get information from our Command of Wildlife Habitat um, website. And we have all our programs, all the Zoom programs are online for you to take a look at as well. So my favorite quote of all that um, got us motivated at the start, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And Margaret Mead is the source. And I know that when we started our project in 2002, we had maybe 29 habit certified habitats that had all people had already done it before we started our project. And the idea of getting 500 backyard wildlife habitats seemed overwhelming. But we did it with the idea that we were going to create an island in harmony with nature, one yard at a time. And we're now up to 1,003, so it's, it's happening, and, and it's, it's a great way to, to not sob when the logging trucks roll off the island. It's our action step that we can do things in our, in our yards, and even though there's regulations that allow things to happen, there's still action steps that we can take that um, are going to help out. So references, Living with Wildlife and Landscaping for Wildlife are by Russell Link. He's the fish and wildlife biologist I mentioned um, early on that talks about the area one, the area two, and the area three parts of our yard. So that's all good information because it's all about the Pacific Northwest. The National Wildlife Federation has their book as well, Attracting Birds, Butterflies. They, they, this is their, their new edition. They had another one. Oh, that they just updated a couple years ago. So that's more general U.S. And the, the, the top two are definitely the, the, the Russell Link lives on Woodby. And there is our welcome to Camino Island. We're a certified wildlife habitat. It's not the sign is now over by the Terry's Corner. And if you notice, it's gone because we have one of our habitat stewards is buffing it up and making it um, pretty again since it got a little weathered. So there you go. I um, I have there's the show. Any questions? So I have made it so you can unmute yourselves, I think. So you can unmute and ask a question or you can type it in the chat. Sure, there's a lot of questions for Val. I just um, certified with um, Wildlife Federation. Mm -hmm. So I want to do the same thing with you guys. Uh, uh, do I need to do the process or just show you the certification? So you, if you, you have, you certified with National Wildlife Federation and you have a number? I do. I have to look it up. Yes, I do. Okay. And um, when did you do it? Um, 
I've been working on my land for some time, but I just did it last week. Okay. Then um fairly new. So then you're you're certified and I'll add you to my list. So now we're a thousand four. And um and if you want to sign, I can meet you at the park and ride and you can get a sign if you want to add that to your yard. We do the programs the third Wednesday of the month, and we're gonna do Zoom till the end of the year. But um, once we start going again, we do them at the, the blue building, the Camino. Yeah, I actually met you when I first moved here. Oh, okay. Met you over, over the phone because I wanted to do, you know, um, native plants and all of that in the very beginning. Uh -huh. So you so you guys you, you guys are gonna start meeting again every third Wednesday. Yeah, we we have it. Um, we have Zoom programs until, um, I. For the rest of the year just because things change and whatnot and then but we'll go back to doing our programs at the at the center again okay so to get the sign i need to just call you up or send you in uh, something via me awesome yep yep i and, shall do it yeah and i can just meet you at the terry's corner park and ride awesome i've That's been awesome. there a bunch this covid season <laughs> <laughs> so great good. when people put the signs up i do get calls and they they um people say well i can do that and so it's great advertising for us and the the towy picture the the picture of bump baker and the, with the towy is um bev paulson did that specifically for our backyard wildlife project one of our habitat stewards lolly um wanted a smiling towy on it so so we we think that our towy there is is smiling Okay, I just uh, you absolutely correct when I let my land go and let things grow and everybody goes like, why don't you take care of him like because it's inside my yard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah. So you it really helps I'm thinking about getting one of those little goats at the you know where the roosters are and there's the little goats when you come onto the island that yeah that antique store it's like oh I, I could use a little goat. <laughs> Uh, you you mentioned something about speaking at the um, meeting in the HOA and that kind of stuff. We do have an HOA here. Uh huh. Uh, um, so how does that work? Oh, you just um, contact me and and I can I can do a presentation if you want. Okay, I'll, I need to talk to the HOA president first before, you know what I mean. But I would like that to, because it would be nice if everybody kind of come on board. Oh yeah, and we we do certify neighborhoods. So if 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 like twenty five percent of a neighborhood will certify, then uh, then we we consider it a neighborhood habitat within our community wildlife habitat. And I I have a sign that that people the community that neighborhood can put up. So Roxy has, is a certified neighborhood, and um, by one block long street. <laughs> Yeah, and it's but, kind of like you determine how big your area is because it's it, on the island. It's it's kind of difficult, so um, so it, it's kind of like you you determine what would be your neighborhood, like Crestview. I think that's where Pilar is, and the Scandia um, okay. Road area. They they're certified as a neighborhood. Okay, I know that the meeting is um, the second week, I think, of August. Mm -hmm. So 14, 15th of August, somewhere in there. So I'll be in touch with you very shortly. Oh, cool. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Stacy has her hand up. Hi, Stacy. You have a question? Yeah, hi. Um, I missed the recording. Is there any way I could start over or watch it in whole? Yeah, well, uh, as soon as this is finished, we have to, it has to go through some processing and then it'll put it up. I'll put it up on our YouTube channel so you okay. can see the whole thing and okay. uh, share it with others. And that, that takes, you know, maybe it may take me a day because I've got something on tomorrow, but it, it'll be up shortly. And Thank you. it will be, the link will be on our website. And um, if I get my act together, I'll send out email to everybody who's registered. So. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Great. Janet. Hi, Joyce. So we have one question in the chat that uh, says, do you, if you provide still water, how do you prevent mosquitoes? The mosquitoes, you know, this was a, when we started the project was, was when West Nile virus was um, 
just coming out into the news. And the the problem isn't the bird bass. The problem is like tires, the old tires that are collecting water or old buckets that are collecting waters. But the bird baths, they, they don't hold water long enough to, to bother. I know in the summer I need to fill my bird bath a couple of times during the day. So, you know, I, I need to make sure my bird bath's clean and, that, and I need to do that whether there's a mosquito problem or not because uh, that's just keeping my supplemental area clean for the birds. But um, the, the mosquitoes, are not a problem generally with the bird bath unless you you're letting it sit for a long time the the bottom part that and not let, not continuing to fill it it's it's that standing water like that's sitting in a gutter or sitting in an old pail or something that like a if there's some kind of a a catch you know like if you had like a you left a cup outside in the in your area three and you left that cup out there and it, the water is sitting there and getting old and then the, that's when you have mosquito problems but not the bird bath itself did that answer your question fran or do you have a follow-up question who else has a question or a comment Fran says, that's great, thanks. I don't know if you can see the chat, Val. No, I... So I typed some of the um, links in that you mentioned. Um, so you can get, you can download the certification, um, our certification uh, form from our website, or you can go online and, and certify with the National Wildlife Federation. Val likes to have them come into her because she then she can tell me and we can we can update the number on the website. If you go through the National Wildlife Federation, she will get that list. It just takes a little while. So it's it's up to you. We want you to certify. We don't care how you do it or when you do it, but please certify because that lets everybody know that there's active people in, engaged and um, and interested, and that makes a big difference. And when people certify, it's. Uh... Oh, I, I, I lost my train of thought. It's kind of, um, oh, I, I don't even know what I was going to say. I thought I'd remember. But it's it's an action step, and it's it's taking a stand on something, and it makes you more conscientious. Oh, I know what it is. I, I knew if I rambled enough, I'd come back. Uh, you get the certificate. You also get a magazine uh, from the National Wildlife Magazine for a year. So you, you're not a... You, then they'll ask you if you want to be a member of the National Wildlife Federation, but you're certified for as long as you live on the property. And um, what we like people to certify is because it, it gets people conscientious about what they're doing in their yards and, and, and thinking about the types of plants they get and, and what they're going to let stay rather than rip out. And, and then it, it kind of is nice to show that a lot of people are doing it. So like, um, you know, with, with the idea of having a neighborhood habitat, it's that's been kind of an action step for some of the neighborhood habitats. It's like that some of the neighbors have wanted to do some things that were kind of detrimental to the environment. And by, by doing the neighborhood habitat, it got people thinking a little more conscientiously about what's going on in their environment. And, you know, living on an island where our water is, is right underneath us, it's our only it's the only source of water that we have for drinking, um, unless you want bottled water, which definitely is another issue with plastic bottles. So anyway, we want our water to be clean. And so we, being a wildlife habitat helps us, it helps the critters. Okay, any other questions? Are there comments? Well, thank you all for joining. It's a beautiful night and we know that you've given up um, gardening time to be with us. We really do appreciate that. And we hope you'll spread the word. And come back in, in August and we'll have something on eagles. Pat Holmes will be doing her eagle program and, and she's fabulous. She does the program at the, she used to do it at the state parks and I don't know if they're back having programs this year, but, but um, we get to learn about the eagles at the state park and how they are working. I know my little eaglet in the yard, I'm expecting him to take off any moment. So thank you all, thanks again.
Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks so much.